calculus students, let's talk about how not to fall for the classic mistake. This classic mathematical mistake may be how you have learned math up till now. It may be a technique that you know and love and makes you feel safe and calm, but it's a trap, and it's a trap that's going to bite you over and over again. And here's the trap. The trap is the following kind of thinking. You look at a problem and you say, oh, when a problem looks like this, it means I do this. It's that pattern that's the trap. Here's what the classic mistake might look like in Algebra 2. You're learning about this kind of thing, and the teacher solves them. They show you some examples, and those examples look like this. And you spot a pattern. You say, my god, when it looks like this, I just do this. I just split it into two parts, and then you might even realize, wow, you don't even have to do that. I can just jump straight from the problem to the answers, because I'm noticing, like, one, that's the opposite of negative one, and this is the opposite of that, and this is the opposite of that. So. It looks like you've got this thing nailed. You totally can do this. And then the test comes around, and you see problems that look like this. And you say, oh, yeah, I recognize this. When it looks like this, you do this. x equals 1, x equals negative 11. I am a champion. And you get the problem wrong. And then you get to this problem, and you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've never seen anything that looks like this before. I don't even know how to do this. Did you even teach us this? And of course, this is really the exact same underlying concept as the problems up here. The problem with the classic mistake is you're focusing on the wrong thing. You don't want to say when a problem looks like this, you do this. Instead, you want to be trying to spot what's the underlying concept. So for these problems, of course, it's the zero product properly, property, and the concept is when you have any number of things being multiplied that end up as zero, you know that at least one of them has to be zero, because that's the only way the entire product can be zero. That's the thing that lets you split it up into separate pieces. That's why this is really the same underlying concept, even though it's got an e to the x, and you'd never seen that in a problem before. It's still just something that you're multiplying, so you know that that's one of the things that might be zero. And of course, when you break it out, you realize, OK, well, that's not one of the things that's going to give me a solution, because this can never be zero for any value of x. On a recent test, we had a problem about a wolf population. And I said that the population of wolves, uh, the rate of change of the population is proportional to 900 minus the population. And so you wrote a differential equation like this. And some of you solved it, and some of you didn't. And I gave you some information. I said that at time 0, there were 500, and that some number of years later, there was a different number. And then the last question I asked was, what's the limit as time approaches infinity of the population? And I think a lot of people, there was no work shown here. A lot of people just wrote 900. And they wrote, it's the, it approaches the carrying capacity. And I think you did that just because every other problem we've done so far, when you've seen this, the answer is always it's asymptotically approaching the limit. But what you didn't do is you didn't actually think about the information that the problem was telling you. If I've got 500 wolves in year 0 and 200 wolves in year 3, uh, that certainly doesn't seem like it's going to be approaching the carrying capacity. So that should be a red flag already that something's going wrong. A lot of people even had an equation where if you actually looked at the limit, it was going to show you that the population was decreasing, not increasing, but yet you wrote 900 anyway. And I'm having trouble explaining this to myself in any other way except that when you saw this, you thought, nailed it. I got this one. And you didn't actually think about what was going on in the problem. Um, but this is not actually what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about something else. I've asked you a lot about problems that look like this. And if I asked you to evaluate it, I hope that you would recognize that it's improper and you would rewrite it this way. It's improper because the integral involves a vertical asymptote. And you would rewrite it properly by not actually evaluating the integral at the asymptote. Instead, uh, having the definite integral involve a variable and taking the limit as that variable approaches the asymptote. OK, so I think you're good on that kind of thing. But here's what I'm worried about. Just like the Algebra 2 student, I'm worried that you're not thinking about the underlying concept, is there a vertical asymptote? I'm worried that you're just looking for things that look like this. 
So imagine we hadn't just talked about this. In fact, let's say that doesn't exist. What if I just gave you this problem on a test? I'm wondering how many of you would spot this as being improper by recognizing the underlying concept that there's an asymptote involved. Um, I also wonder how many of you might rewrite it this way. Even though there is no asymptote when x equals zero for this problem. So this would be a completely inappropriate thing to write. I'm not sure you would, I'm just curious. I think it's always a good idea to imagine the graphs of your functions if you're able to. And hopefully you recognize this as just a simple right hand shift of the one over x function. So really that asymptote that used to be at zero is now moved over to one and you can verify that numerically just by imagining what what value for x would make this uh, ratio undefined. And so in this case, the problematic thing happens as x approaches 1, and it's approaching it from the negative side. So this would be the appropriate way to rewrite it. I also kind of wonder if anybody would think to simplify this, I mean, not necessarily that it needs simplification, but just I wonder if it would occur to anybody that this integral is the same thing as if you shifted the entire thing back left by one. So the function that you're integrating would become the familiar one over x and the bounds of integration would each just shift left by one. So now instead of the asymptote being at uh, one, the asymptote is back at zero. So k would be approaching zero from the negative side. So this kind of flexibility of thinking is something that I think you want to try to start cultivating in yourself. Um, the way that you do it is you ask yourself explicitly, not what do you do, but what's the underlying concept? What's, what's involved in this kind of problem? Um, and then the second thing you can do is always imagine what are different ways of looking at this same problem? Could I look at it al algebraically? Could I look at it graphically? Could I look at it numerically? What happens when you plug in special values? Um, so I think all of that is likely to help people a lot more in your tests, in your future mathematical work, in your general problem solving in life. So I hope this has been helpful. I'll see you guys in class.